when you do sentiment analysis in the huge set of uh, industries, the companies we're we're trying to help to listen to their customers and employees, uh, out of the box models they don't work. So how do you customize them? You can obviously go through like customizing models to specific use cases, brands, or industries. But a much more powerful way is combining the power of these um, language models and, and letting the customers override the specific lexicons or rules and whatnot. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Aaron Kolak leads a team of machine learning engineers, scientists, and linguists at Qualtrics. Qualtrics is a super big company that you might not have heard of that takes large language models and applies them to real world B2B use cases. This is a really interesting interview and I hope you enjoy it. Aaron, thanks so much for for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, I kind of thought a good place to start would be Qualtrics. And, you know, it happens to be a company that I know well because I've worked with Qualtrics for a long time and, you know, a a real star employee of mine, John La, um, you know, ended up over there. And so, um, you know, I know Qualtrics well, but I'm thinking a lot of um, a lot of our listeners will not have, will not know even what Qualtrics does. So maybe you could just start by saying what uh, what does Qualtrics the the company do, and then tell us how um, machine learning fits into to Qualtrics. Sure, I think that would be a good starting point. Um, like many B two B companies, sometimes it's a little bit uh, you know not obvious when you just use the techn- technical terms to explain what the company does, but um, when we get to the bottom of it, it actually is pretty cool. So let me start. Um, we as individuals, human beings, um, use products, consume services every day. So every single uh, usage of a product or a brand, being a customer brand, even working for a company or an organization, being an employee, from the individual's perspective, is an experience. Every single transaction is for us an experience. Going to a restaurant, taking a flight, taking an interview, working somewhere for some time is an experience. So um, what Quadrix is does is basically giving our customers tools to design these experiences, track those experiences, analyze those experiences, and act on those experiences. So there's four pillars to experience management. So overall, we're trying our customers to help they manage, find, detect, um, and fill those experience uh, gaps. So our company roots started um, a somehow interesting domain, uh, which is surveys, um, especially in social scientists and business schools. Uh, doing surveys is the primary tool to do research. Um, and our founders um, were trying to help their father to um, you know, build a survey tool. And then that, it just exploded. Uh, it just became phenomenally successful. And then at the next iteration um, of, um, uh, the, as the next level, uh, those users of surveys, students and researchers came back in the enterprise setting with different problems, trying to understand what customers think. And that became our, basically, um, we shifted a little bit towards markets research and understanding um, customers, employees and whatnot. And eventually, Last few years, um, we've been working on this new category, which is experience management. So um, we would like to think of ourselves as founders and leaders in that space. Could you tell us a little bit about the scale of Qualtrics? Sure. That's a great question. I would like to think about scale in um, a couple of different ways. One of them is obviously number of customers we have. And, and we have uh, tens of thousands of customers. And um, but I would like to think about other ways in terms of actually number of touch points we are going through our systems, number of experiences we are analyzing, and also the diversity of the type of experiences and channels from which um, you can actually track and improve experiences. So in that respect, we our systems analyze millions of experiences every day. And we have different channels and modalities. That's social media channels or other um, input channels such as surveys, um, tech surveys, web surveys, mobile, um, and social media, call center. So these various modalities um, we're actually uh, collecting and analyzing this data from. That is kind of, for me, one one other aspect of uh, scaling. 
And so what are like the really important ML applications to Qualtrics? Is it somehow like processing those surveys in different ways? Like what's, what's, what's really at the core? Absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, survey is one of the, um, and, and one of the most important channels, but it's, it's not the only one. But even in surveys, um, there's definitely a big part of the data that's being structured. And uh, in my opinion, uh, there's experience data is most uh, easily or most naturally expressed in unstructured data. So where one of the obvious things where ML comes into the equation is analyzing unstructured part of the surveys, such as open text questions, analyzing sentiment, emotion, effort, and finding what uh, folks are talking about, employees or customers, uh, what is um, individual team-specific sentiment, emotion. These are the sort of stuff where um, obviously machine learning utilizes mostly, but obviously there's other aspects. For example, the minute you go into a uh, call center, then um, comes conversation, which is a totally different beast. Can you make this more concrete? Create for me though, like tell me sure. like like one kind of common survey that that people might not realize happens. Yeah, right. I think more folks would probably know about CSAT and MPS. Uh, MPS stands for Net Promoter Score, and CSAT stands for Customer Satisfaction Score. So these are well-established industry standards where uh, businesses basically ask their qu- uh, questions, customers, and and the, those surveys can be structured, or the input channels, so the input channels can be structured depending on how you score and what you express. And you might be actually just feeling in your experience. What, what, how was your experience, Lucas? Um, and you might be just feeling it a bit like, oh, the price was um, great, but um, the, the service was not good, right? Um, and you might imagine big, big enterprises, um, when they're trying to listen to their customers, there might be literally, uh, you know, possibly practically infinite many, <laughs> infinitely many topics uh, customers might be thinking about. So how do you detect and, and, and act on this? So this is where it comes uh, uh, machine learning, specifically NLP, detecting what your customers are talking about. Is it the price? Is it the service quality? Is it the taste of the food? Um, and then what is the sentiment, topic level sentiment on this? What's the emotion on this? Um, things like that. I hope that made it a bit more concrete. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, Make it even a little more concrete for for people that don't know. I mean, we we actually measure um, NPS religiously at, at weights and biases. People sometimes complain that you know we're asking too much, but you know we really love to to ask NPS, and that's you know a measure of like would you recommend this product to a friend on like I think a scale of one to ten, right? And then right. you take the nines and tens and subtract the one through six or zero through six. Those are like the, the low ones are like the detractors and the high ones are like the promoters. And it's sort of a sense of like, are people liking your um, product? And then I think is CSAT the one where it's like, um, do you, um, how would you feel if the service went away? Would you be disappointed or not? Is that, is that right? Um, could be, I think depending on the context, the way, good way to think about CSAT and NPS is a little bit um, in the following way. CSAT tends to be focused on transactional experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas um, MPS is more about the relation, your relation to that service provider or, or, or the company or the brand, um, taking into everything in their account. How would you? How is your overall experience? And sorry, and CSAT is like one moment in time or one thing that you did. Yeah, transactional experience. Yes. Yeah. And so, what's like a typical question that like a Qualtrics customer would have about all the NPS data they're collecting? It sounds like they maybe want to know what are the themes of things that people are, are aren't happy about. Right. This exactly. I, I think this is m- the most canonical use case. But right? everybody is obviously every company that cares about customers, right? And and this is this is really um, one of our biggest motivation because um, as you are familiar uh, from the tech uh, big tech companies, um, there are, some of them are phenomenally successful with their customer obsession, right? So how do you enable the rest of the world who doesn't have army of you know data scientists and engineers listen to their customers? And employees too, not just customers, right? So um, our tool can be used in these different um, settings to listen, listen to different personas from their experience perspective. And now, when you when you analyze this free form uh, like NPS like survey data, just to use a specific example, do you, do you come at it with like a specific set of um, categories that you're interested in, or do you kind of 
draw themes out like with clustering or something like that? That is a great question, yes. So um, there's two types of experiences, speaking of experience <laughs> with our products, if you want to do analytics and open-ended questions. Um, this is where you usually most find especially emerging new stuff. Um, you can go with what we call as industry-specific libraries, where our expert, domain experts, and industry specialists collect and, and create these uh, library of topics. But as we know, um, world is changing fast, especially in certain industries. So um, how do you go on top of things? How do you find emerging new stuff? How do you think, make sure things are not under your radar? This is where ML comes into play. So we actually have deploy machine learning and things like topic detection, key phrase detection, things like that, and, and, and surface that with taking the temporality dimension into, um, equi uh, into the equation, of course. And then, yeah, then that's, that's where they dig in, either curated, uh, ready to consume libraries or finding topics on the, on the fly. And now I, I feel like natural language processing in the past few years has moved faster than maybe any other field in, in ML. And suddenly you have um, this explosion of um, large language models, which are quite like evocative, um, you know, in terms of text generation. But, you know, I'm always wondering like how much this affects businesses like Qualtrics. Like, do, do you use large language models a lot? And, and um, if so, like where do you use them and, and not use them? And how are you thinking about that? Right. So um, I would like to first uh, <laughs> mention a, a disclaimer. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of um, ML and deep learning. Having been in uh, University of Toronto during my grad school when all these things happening, mm -hmm. you can't escape that gravity, obviously. For sure. But also having been in ML for so long, um, uh, we our approach is pretty much uh, going after what our customers' needs dictate. As you know, as you covered in this uh, blog post many times, large language models, contextual models, cross-lingual models, they're game-changing, right? If you use it the right way, if you use it kind of... Um, identify the right situation uh, for them, they can be really powerful. And we do. We do we do use large language cross language model a lot. But you might be surprised, we also use rule-based systems a lot. I think um, rule-based systems, um, heuristics, they enable you to go not only fast and be scrappy, and also enables quite a bit of customization. Um, because when you use large language models, when you do sentiment analysis in the huge set of uh, industries, the companies we're we're trying to help to listen to their customers and employees, uh, out of the box models they don't work. So how do you customize them? You can obviously go through like customizing models to specific use cases, brands, or industries. But a much more powerful way is combining the power of this. Um, language models and, and letting the customers override the specific lexicons or rules and whatnot. So yeah, we have the full spectrum, starting from classical linguistic analysis, um, lexicons all the way to the bleeding edge uh, deep learning models. Language models, we use the full spectrum. And, and uh, I think the future includes a hybrid um, for us, at least for the foreseeable future. And when you use these large language models, um... Where are you getting them? Are you using like Hugging Face or are you using some of the APIs out there like OpenAI or Amazon or others? Like, how do you think about that? Do you feel like it's important for you to train your own? Uh, yes, because um, for a lot of the problems we're looking at, it, just taking a model, the training a bit of training data, tuning the, to the domain, there are obviously problems that can be solved with just like simple tuning, a domain adaptation, but um, there is a large spectrum of them problems where it's, it's, it's not sufficient for us. Uh, there's also the whole aspect that when you operate at the scale, we are dealing with millions of you know, um, short and long text uh, conversations. We also need to care about scale. So model compression is uh, a big area for us as well. Right now we're focusing on. Um, we do use pretty common the, the, the um, XLM Roberta type of models. Um, we experiment all like latest and greatest stuff that's coming our way and, and we pick the right model for the line setup. And if need be, um, we also customizing them um, in terms of the downstream application, in terms of the, you know, uh, combining the language models with other modalities and whatnot. Um, and, and how much customization we do um, in the model, how much tuning, where do we freeze? It all depends on the exact specific use case. Do you feel like the advances in 
NLP has changed your approach to machine learning over the last few years? Absolutely. Um, I think, again, it's a powerful, powerful tool. Um, it's not the silver bullet for everything, but especially organizations like us who tackle multilingual data in, in low resource languages, um, it has been a big, powerful tool. Interesting. So how do you use it for low resource languages? I, I have to be careful here because when I say low resource language, I might not be using the exactly the academical sense of low resource because that, that seems to be a bit moving target these days. Sure. What, what I mean is from our perspective, um, you know, um, obviously every business have a target um, depending on where they operate and what kind of products they're developing, have business priorities in terms of languages they want to handle. And, and um, the amount of English data, both in terms of raw, labeled or customer feedback data, which we use to train these models. Obviously, for English, we have disproportionately more English data than, say, um, even even some common European languages, right? Um, and um, some of the success we got from these models, just purely based on zero-shot learning, was sometimes like uh, more than enough for getting, getting a POC out there mm -hmm. and then iterating on it because... More often than not, um, I don't know, having been in this field multiple times, like getting training data labeling can always be an issue. Like sometimes it's a chicken egg problem. If I have one, one product out there, then I will have customers doing some edits for me or, or like, you know, giving feedback and data. But how do I get there if I don't even have a model working? Mm -hmm. So zero shot in a way game changer in respect because it enables to, as long as you set the expectations right, Get something out there, make it a win-win situation for you and your customers while start data pouring in and you iterate from there, from the feedback, from the, uh, you know, implicit or explicit uh, labels uh, that comes to your system. Mm -hmm. In that respect, it's been game-changing. Um, obviously, when you think practically, um, in the past, if you want to support for a, any NLP system in X languages or K many languages, you probably need K many language experts, K many lang sub teams um, uh, working on those. Uh, mm -hmm. But right now, uh, again, it's not a silver bullet for everything, every use case, but for a lot of the use cases, um, simple investments on small data sets can go a long way. There's also actually um, changing the paradigm in a different way too, uh, Lucas, in my opinion. Um, in the past, when you were doing it, when you were doing an IP project, every single project, whether it's the same project in different language or a different functionality in the same language, would require almost like from a data perspective, getting like ground zero. You start from ground zero. You cannot share data set pretty much. Mm -hmm. But this cross linguality, uh, this pre-trained language models combined with cross linguality enables um, basically doing a lot of uh, new ideas, new projects for a fixed amount of budget. Mm -hmm. Just because the amount of data data you need to tune into a new feature or a new language is just just significantly smaller, mm. and that has been for us and for many others uh, I know in our industry, uh, I mean in, in technology and NLP space, um, have been changing the way they look at data. Interesting. So how does this actually work? So you'd say you have some, um, you know, French language survey results. When, when you say zero shot, do you mean that you, you take some kind of like embedding and put it into some comparable space as the English? Or how do you actually approach like the, the rarer languages practically? Um, let, let's take an artificial problem, like a text classification. Mm -hmm. I want to cl classify to ABC, whatever, yep. a, a sentiment and whatnot. We actually uh, share this in our blog post, but um, basically you train for English. Mm -hmm. um, say uh, you may have more data on it or label data on it. And for French, um, if you have limited data, the least you can do is using that data for testing. How is my zero shot performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we we have like little data sets this is in these uh, language, languages and, and we sound like, okay, from a test perspective, it looks good enough to get, or even pretty satisfactory to get um, uh, coming close to the English performance or whatever the pro like you know performance metric we want to uh, hit. Um, and if they're not, you know, kind of you get an idea of how your per per model is doing. And then that might be enough for you to get a V0 out there and start collecting data from a feedback perspective. Because our, our, our systems allow, not all, but some of them are allow us actually customers to give feedback in terms of our predictions. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that basically compared to what, how we would do these kind of things in not, I mean, not even like five years ago, 
um, you had to go and start from uh, from scratch in French, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really impressive. It just works like reasonably well right out of the gate, typically. Usually, uh, but again, um, some problems sometimes, not all of them. Nevertheless, very uh, very very useful. Do you end up training separate models for each customer then? Like, are you fine tuning new models in every single customer's pieces of data? And, and if you have like thousands of customers, does that create like a huge logistical problem for you? Yeah, th that's a great question. First of all, a couple of years ago, this, even if that was the right thing, it would not be feasible. I mean, practically uh, very, very challenging, but these days, uh, fortunately, uh, hyperscalers provide a lot of functionality with various services in terms of multiple modal endpoints and, and, and asynchronous predictions, path predictions, and whatnot. So you don't have to have a, a modal endpoint for every single <laughs> uh, language or, or, or task you have. Um, but we do a combination. Um, uh, we try to use multitasking uh, as often as we can. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just some, it's like a, it's, it's a powerful tool, um, obviously. Um, more often than not, you basically uh, get a linear, uh, if, uh, proportionally linear uh, return on your on your uh, combination of the tasks. So instead of having n models, you have basically one model doing n tasks. If it is possible, if it's applicable, mm -hmm. it obviously from a from a model lifecycle uh, management perspective, it generates its own uh, challenges as well, and that needs to be taken into account in the long term design because. Then you're coupling models, right? If model requirements change, you need to update one or one task. Um, you don't need, do you really need to update other tasks? And and how do you think about what a task is here? So I'm, I'm imagining if you have- Let's give a concrete example. Yeah, yeah. Let's say um, you're trying to predict um, sentiment on um, a given text. Um, and you might ima imagine um, sentiment um, and other related uh, more nuanced dimensions of, of human experience, say emotion and and uh, and whatnot, or other, other things you want to predict about this um, intent and whatnot. So same input, and you basically can predict at the same time with a single model, um, what's the emotion, what's the intent, what's the um, sentiment at the same time. So these are individual tests, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be a single prediction that it can be a, a classification test combined with a sequence to sequence task. Doesn't matter. So, um, but if you're doing this on behalf of two customers, do you consider that to be a single task, or does each customer look like a different task? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, um, that reminds me. I didn't quite answer your first question. Um, we don't do, um, as I mentioned, for customer um, specific needs. We tend to think in terms of giving customer the full power to customize or overwrite the uh, behavior of the model. Mm -hmm. That is comes through using um, various enrichments we do to the text on top of the, like, whatever the target task. You can also do all the linguistic enrichments, and you can combine these linguistic enrichments with rules and other heuristics to actually overwrite the model behavior. Mm -hmm. There are some initiatives going on, uh, which I'm not at the liberty of discussing here, but, but yeah, we are, we are thinking of, you know, uh, enabling customization on, a, uh, on the ML level as well. This is, this is not implemented yet. I see. But... I guess do you do you does allowing the individual customers to like kind of customize what the models what the, the outputs doing? I guess that means there's a single underlying model that's feeding the customers, and then they sort of override it. That's right, right, right. Um, that's a good point. Um, that is, um, I think I should have made uh, now that distinction in upfront. So we have two types of models. One of them is what you call as universal models. These are models that work for all customers the same way, mm -hmm. irrespective of um, who's sending the data. But we have also customer-specific models. Mm -hmm. For example, um, we have this um, tool called Predict IQ, where you can use experience data, which calls the X data, or operational data, O data, combination of those to build predictive models, starting with churn prediction. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's uh, John's <laughs> one of John's <laughs> products. But mm -hmm. so for the Predict IQ, by definition, is a um, customer-specific. Because you, as the customer, bring your own data, define what your variables are, or let our system to kind of do auto ML and 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 do the do you automatically build, train, optimize, and deploy a model for you. Mm -hmm. And as new data comes in, you can actually, in a streaming fashion, you can predict the so customer-specific model and universal models. 
Mm-hmm. But I understood with your question initially by mistake was like, what about these universal models? How do you customize them? So our approach with that is like letting the customer overwrite behavior so it's not completely ML based. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there is, we can envision a future where uh, we can totally completely let customers give feedback and continue to train these models. This, this is this is more on the thinking right now. There is no um, concrete I see. Uh, plans or, or commitment on that one. And now I guess like, um, you know, processing language data is pretty different from, you know, predicting churn, right? I mean, do, when, you, when you think about like predicting churn from, you know, survey results or something like that, does does deep learning have any role to play, or do you go to kind of more traditional models for that kind of tabular data? Um, that, that's a great question, Lucas. Um, <laughs> the, the the interesting thing is that um, people have been trying to extend some of these ideas um, that came from transformers to um, tabular data as well. I think there are some variations of developed specifically for um, tabular data, but I'm not convinced that the concept of um, pre-training, which is where the most of the power I think, for these language models come from, doesn't quite apply, at least not in our setting. Everybody's customer data, everybody's um, transaction data um, is different. The semantics of it is different. That being said, there is a future which we are investing towards where um, we'll be able to hopefully, um, we, we, have, we, we give our user customers options to schematize their data to map them to a kind of a shared um, schema. And when that happens, obviously, um, things things change a little bit. Then you can actually envision a future where learnings um, can translate, global global patterns can translate uh, from one data set to another. Um, and what would this mean to map to a schema? Like, does this mean kind of standardizing the customer names and standardizing the definition of churn or something else? Right. Not quite that, more like, for example, think about uh, the following. Uh, say um, you have a question about MPS, um, right? Like um, how likely are you to uh, uh, recommend um, company or product X to your friends? Now you can imagine this can be expressed in, in, in many, many different lexical and semantic way, uh, forms, right? And different languages. So capturing that question, um, you know, like identify, hey, this is the same question and this is the same. This is an age question. This is an uh, income question, right? That, that, that is, that is ba- basically you're structuring the data mm. in, in that way uh, and, and identifying the fields and numerical values and, and the ranges and whatnot. Then data becomes mappable. Data becomes, uh, you know, transferable. Learnings become transferable. Going back to predict IQ, um, problem, yes. Um, we use, again, um, deep learning there as well, mostly canonical uh, techniques. Um, but um, not surprisingly, with tabular data, um, tree-based models are pretty successful, even if they're not necessarily always successful in terms of um, performance metrics, just much easier to work with them uh, just because you know they have this natural way of dealing with missing data, combining categorical and continuous features, numerical features, and, and, and whatnot. So there's lots of ways. Got it. Got um, it. One way of still using deep learning, again, in tabular data is obviously even in tabular data there, are, uh, you can imagine certain questions are still open-ended. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. So I guess um, what does yeah. your um, infrastructure look like? Are you, have you kind of standardized everyone on a, on a single machine learning platform? Or have you standardized the... Um, the frameworks that that people use, or is it is it open ended? I think in many ways we are far ahead from uh, past experiences or uh, from colleagues um, that I know uh, when we discuss about you know the ML ecosystem and the state of affairs with uh, colleagues. But um, we have one advantage uh, in a way: our ML platform development efforts are relatively new, so we leverage a lot of the. Um, functionality these days um, are coming from hyperscalers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, couple of years ago, like, I mean, um, building an ML platform was a very big deal, right? Being able to support different hardware, different workflows, different personas was, even even for a small ML team, was a big, big deal. 
these days, um, we are using hyperscalers, obviously, uh, moving a lot of the kind of uh, heavy lifting to uh, hyperscale functionality. And most of the work we do is basically harmonizing our data and our workflows and expressing them operation in terms of the, um, our, our platform, which is based on tools like SageMaker and whatnot. Mm. Um, but yeah, so uh, our current ML training, serving, scientist work, uh, workbenches are all standardized. Um, yet, this is a fast-moving field. There's a lot of new systems, right? Uh, there's small and big players. You mix and match and, and they try to leverage the best of both worlds. Where do you feel like there are gaps? Like if somebody was listening and was thinking about making, you know, a company to, to do some ML tooling, where, where would you guide them? Or, you know, if our product team wanted to roll out something new, what would you appreciate the most? First of all, having been doing ML almost 20 years now, one of the things I most appreciate is it's kind of a dream coming true for me, seeing such a big ecosystem Things like, for example, experiment tracking, right? Um, all of all those of us who went through grad school by, you know, tracking things. Um, I always make this analogy. Um, I used to work in computational biology field, and um, a lot of my, um, you know, uh, collaborators and peers have this really nicely organized um, experiment notebooks, right? And I, yeah. I'm like, I will never uh, be successful in this field because I'm never organized, and and in the files and whatnot. Because we're computer scientists, we can still, you know, write. Uh, scripts and whatnot to organize even if how messy things are. But when I work today, I see tools like weight and biases, um, other tools for, you know, uh, monitoring, model performance monitoring. Do you have a favorite performance monitoring tool? Is, it, is there one you actually, that, that you use? Not yet. We've actually narrowed it down to uh, a couple of things, but uh, we are, we're still actively working on it. Uh, but my, my, my point here is that one of the things um, I strongly um recommend my uh, team is leveraging um, productivity boosting tools such as experimentation tracking mm. reproducibility for mm. me the biggest gap is still in CICD mm. um, for a couple of reasons because I don't think it's as well understood as other parts of ML lifecycle and there are different personas involved data scientists ML scientists uh, ML engineer uh, you know um, application engineer, that is a complex problem. I think the nature of the problem is complex. Um, solving that problem to me, it seems like a like really, really big. And I, I see some actors, um, including yourself, um, are doing some really interesting stuff out there. So I'm, I'm eagerly observing this field. I think some of the core infrastructure problem in terms of ability to support different hardware combinations, scale and all that stuff, that's been solved to, do, to our large degree these days. To me, the next level is really winning the scientists and MLE personas building something really um, they can connect to because I see the adoption of these tools are still owing to a being new industry. I, I still think the adoption is not quite there. Um, so yeah, CICD, I guess I would put in the top there. Um, and, and, and also depending on your application area, monitoring. Um, and the third, I would probably put, depending again, your industry your application focus area, um, monitoring, but with a more focus on not from an operational perspective, but more from a fairness and bias perspective. Um, there are, um, these are obviously a good thing to pay attention to this. And there's also um, um, these days um, societal and, and legal reasons to pay uh, more attention to this kind of system, uh, systems and regulations. Is there any tooling that you're using or have, have built to, to help with kind of fairness or? Um, any kind of explainability at, at, at Qualtrics? Right. Um, we are definitely looking at that because we, we, we know our, our systems are we use in a, in a kind of context-sensitive uh, applications. Um, I don't want to disclose any kind of specific names, but um, one thing that's happening, I'm sure you probably are aware is in this space, is that testing AI systems, developing kind of testing frameworks, behavioral measurement frameworks for them, is fortunately... Um, took off lately. So there's both um, tools from academia, papers, tools, as well as um, industry. I haven't seen industry adopting it as much. I might be wrong there, uh, to be frank. Um, there's still, I think, some some way, way, way to go there. But um, 
this is becoming we, we are definitely looking at it we are looking at our our models how they're behaving under like you know certain for example gender bias either so, social identity biases um but bias can creep up in many ways right um so um this is going to be a continuous effort in our in our agenda hmm. how do you think about building your team like what I guess how how is your team structured now, and what skill sets do you look for? Well, let me start with what my team does. Um, I guess um, uh, so. We 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 deal basically all things uh, ML, from building the ML platform to working building data set ontologies libraries for um, uh, NLP applications and and beyond. Um, and then um, I have uh, two applied science teams that are, one of them is really focusing on NLP uh, and LX uh, applications. Um, as I mentioned, we, we discussed uh, a lot about surveys, but surveys are basically solicited feedback. Um, Qualtrics, you would be surprised, we're looking more in terms of volume of the data, actually, uh, much more text data is coming from other channels, social media and, and, and customer support applications. So for NLX, um, obviously, we have a large team and then we have made certain um, uh, investment in this area to really grow our uh, footprint and expertise in this one. The other team uh, we have is uh, focusing more on infusing ML to all our product lines. Um, and that includes more canonical applications of ML from time series modeling, anomaly detection, recommendation systems, um, uh, path optimization, yield optimization, to um, fraud detection um, and, and things like that. Um, and this, it really um, depends on what business, for them for NLX, obviously we're looking for subject matter experts, right? Though, as I mentioned, um, as much as we, we love and use deep learning, uh, where we hire a deep learning expert, we are also looking, make sure our, we are linguistically grounded. So we have a lot of linguist experts who are actually building um, you know, very um, deep linguistic packages analysis so to make sure we marry these systems in the right way uh, to solve our customers' need. On the more canonical problems, we are actually trying to have a, a diverse team from a skill set perspective, deep learning, statistics, engineering. That field requires really going fast, solving problems and not necessarily all the time coming with a new approach or, or bleeding edge algorithms. Interesting. And do you think there's anything that, like, you know, specifically makes somebody successful at, at Qualtrics or, or on, on your team outside of, like, the kind of normal things that a, a company would look for? Um, sure. Um, so Qualtrics, um, ML is, um, we've been very focused on over the years as, as our uh, uh, vision evolved. Um, data and ML is becoming more and more central to our business because listening to these different channels, different data models, understanding and predicting and ability to give an actionable data to our customers to me boils down to deep data skills. And we have a lot of ways to leverage this different data, marrying experience data with operations data. And we are uniquely positioned to do that. So somebody who are, maybe I should even answer the room, why consider quad, Quadrix if you're working in, for example, in, in ML field? I think it's it's pretty much um, a lot to do with the uniqueness of the problems and the data sets. When we look at the spectrum of problems, yes, we do have a lot of problems where you can immediately relate to, but there's a lot of problems that are very unique um, that doesn't e exist in, in other fields or the data sets don't exist. In, in other places that are unique. Um, obviously the volume is there, right? The volume of the data we're tackling with. Um, but someone, um, I particularly speaking from experience from my team um, and myself, um, developing ML applications for uh, in a B2C setting is very different than B2B setting. You're dealing with a different customer personas. The supporting the ML cycle, ability, when you think about the model lifecycle, ability to new models refresh, the implications of them are much more per permanent in, in an enterprise scale. It's like switching one model just because of a new result, new better results is not as fast 
um, as uh, or you don't you don't have as much um, degree of freedom as you would have in I would say a B two C setting. I might be overgeneralizing here, but that's my uh, kind of own personal experience. Um, what else? Yeah, I, I guess uh, being B two B, being um, working on a very unique data set and problems where um, it's not always easy to go look up a paper, implement a technique. You need to really be creative and 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 synthesize new solutions, come up with new t- ways to look at the data. I guess um, looking at your your career, you when you came from school into academia, you went to Amazon right like what what was the biggest surprise i mean it's always kind of a shock for people i think you know going from like research to practical applications what was the biggest surprise for you biggest surprise for me um well right actually 2022 exactly 10 years ago when i was doing a, a a graduate internship that was my first industry experience and i was very academically oriented you know uh, usual thing, writing papers, going to conferences, and trying to uh, look at for next step, which is postdoc. Mm-hmm. Um, I did for uh, some uh, personal reasons. Instead of spending a resource summer, I took an industry internship, um, and instead of ending up in a research lab, res- um, which because of visa problems, ended up in a more industry applications lab, and I tremendously enjoyed it um, because um, I, I always at up until that point, I always thought I enjoy like really tackling tough, technical, scientific, open problems. But this event for me, the realization was that I just like solving problems. Um, and ML being in the same space in, uh, in ML where you still like research, applied research field, you every year, every day pretty much is filled with some uncertainty. You still have that um, every day unknown and uh, excitement about what's going to be that this experiment will work. Should I like... There's, you're always continuously thinking, creating, looking at the data, everything changes. It's not, it never gets monotone. Um, it's just, for me, it was never like that. Um, and then um, I was making this joke to um, my, my team members, but to some degree, it's, I think, true. Um, fastest return for your work. Like writing, I've, I have wrote my fair share of papers, but here I see like things going to production. It just gives a different sense of accomplishment, solving problems. And, and even today, when I look at what we're doing at Qualtrics, um, helping our customers solve their customer problems, I think is an amazing feeling. And, and, and that just keeps me going um, and, and focus on staying with problems, even though sometimes the data or technical problems might be very challenging. You, you just you know, you, you're, you are. I know it sounds cheesy a little bit, but it, it, it does. You are changing the world. Um, I just had this terrible experience with um, one of my home projects, and, and, and I feel like I've Send 30 emails, nobody even bothering. I like to think in my way, like, hey, uh, one day, you know, um, somebody at the end of that thing, that there will be a tool, and they think, hey, Erin's experience is broken. Let's surface it up. Let's do something about it. Mm-hmm. This is this is the future we are building for Quadrix. That's great. I've I've definitely come to believe that listening to customer experience survey results is one of the real keys to building a successful company. So I I actually totally identify with that. Um, it's a good segue, actually, into um, you know our last two questions, and and the second to last one is basically what is something that you think is kind of understudied in machine learning? Like, if you had more time, or if you were back in academia, like that, you would you know spend some time looking into because you think it would be valuable. I wouldn't say perhaps maybe not understudied, but one thing I'm I'm making to make the big splash yet is causality. Mm. Um, I must admit. Um, before Qualtrics, for, for a couple of years, I worked in healthcare space. And um, surprisingly, healthcare is about a kind of a super rich with a lot of interesting ML problems, very meaningful problems. But also for various reasons, it also go a bit slow for regularity and other like uh, problems in that space. Um, but, you know, there, it, it's been a, f- a, f- a fertile field for a lot of um, um, causality research. But... Um, we have also in industry because recommendation systems like where we can do some treatment. Um, we, we can see like how these kind of systems can actually do give, um, you know, can make a big boost in terms of how the real way we should do it, think about the or we should think about stochasticity and, and, and you know, uh, uh, predictive systems. But um, one field 
It's just because of the sheer complexity of obtaining treatment data, we need to work with observational data in most settings. And I know there are, are you know, recent interest in kind of making causality work with observational data. And that would be, I think, game changing for a lot of applications. Um, but I, maybe it's not uh, not enough investment in done in that field, or it's just fundamentally a hard problem that we, we need to be patient about. I don't know, but that's one fair field where I'm uh, keenly observing on the side. Sorry, waiting for, yeah. Interesting. And I guess, final question, when, when you think about going from like an idea of a new application to, to deployed working in production, what's the biggest bottleneck? Ah, uh, the, 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 this is a classical question. Um, is this a really classical question or is this just a question I ask all the time? <laughs> well, classical, I'm sorry, sorry, maybe classical is not the right term, sorry. Um, like the, the, the question, uh, the important question, yeah, question right? Question, yeah. um, the reason is that we, we know um, ML is, um, everybody excited about it. ML has proven its value, right? But um, is ML delivering at the um, scale it's been invested in? Probably not. There's all sorts of market research reports out there about showing um, how much ML is failing, why it is failing. I think this, this boils to that question. Like, you know, um, most of the time it's from going from that proof of concept to production. Um, to me, um, in my uh, experience, um, depending on the settings you are, uh, there can be a couple of reasons contributing that. One of them is structural, probably. Um, and this is where most most common case I have observed in my experience from startups to enterprises to hedge funds to other places. So um, it really requires, um, if you're working for ML, unless you're doing platform work really, if you're working with the, uh, 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 working ML for a product feature, that requires um, a really close connection with um, the ML, TP, ML folks with the product folks, right? I've seen time after time ML folks go build models, not co cognizance of the underlying production constraints and whatnot, solving sometimes even the, <laughs> not the problem that's, that the product requires, right? And that can, that's not specific to ML. That's, that's, like, that's a system design problem. You go design the wrong thing or you design the system that's not uh, with respect to the uh, constraints that system needs to work with them. What particularly becomes problematic in ML is that um, if you have, don't have really that structural uh, place, um, structural support processes in place, um, scientists, especially those working on, you know, not maybe current application, but like a bit more deeper technical problem space, it, uh, they can actually, they usually don't know what having a model in production looks like from productionization, from latency, from input, from output, from monitoring, from system design perspective. The way we solve it in Qualtrics is that we empower ML engineers. ML engineers, they know ML, they know their engineers in heart by training, um, and we include them from the get-go, like they're in the, from conception all the way to the product launch. So they moderate and play a very critical role between how this model is going to be used and what's being designed and moderating that. To me, that's the essential role machine learning engineers should play. There's obviously very biased opinion because machine learning engineer or data scientists and applied scientists, I don't think these are universal definitions. Every company goes with their own way what's going on. But I've seen that when you don't have a kind of a, um, a, a person who understands both domains well and get involved from the process in place, and I'm not even counting all these um, uh, infrastructure issues, right? I've seen places where they're trying to do NLP in, in you know, traditional microservice architecture and places like that. You don't have the right architecture, right? Uh, even those, in, if you have the right infrastructure, I think it boils down to having the right people with the right skill set and having a process, really, um, clean process. So you don't have basically everybody doing everything. That's where things start to break down. Um, that's, that's how we do in Qualtrics. We have uh, dedicated roles for specializing uh, different aspects of this process but working always together end to end. This is what we call as the trifecta model. A machine learning engineer, trifecta model. Um, um, so the machine learning engineer, the product engineer, and the ML scientists working together. 
Mm, I see. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. And uh, it's, it's fun to talk to someone who's deploying so many models in production, especially at a, a B2B company. You, you know, you don't hear as many stories of those. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.